And I hold true to the one who breaks my fall And lifts me time and time again Oh my God, so good, you never give up, you never give up on me Oh, what joy I found because of your love, because of your love for me Oh my God, so good Crossroads at Montgomery. We are so glad you could join us this morning. If this is your first time here, I'm Ben, the worship director here at Crossroads. 
This morning we're going to be joining together and worshiping our King. And regardless of where we are, whether we're sitting in our living room or you're with other people, we can still lift his name and know that he is with us. The Spirit is here and we can welcome him into our homes, into our lives, and wherever we are. So why don't you join me? You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. Hey, good morning, Crossroads. Uh, it's Pastor Mike. I am so glad that you're here with us today uh, to be able to worship together. Appreciate all the work that Ben does. And I want to remind you that right after the sermon today, we're going to have kids ministry again. So if you've got kids or grandkids, if you've got any little ones around, or ladies, you know, your husband's IQ probably qualifies him. Um, but, you know, stick around after the sermon and watch kids' ministry. Uh, we hope it's an encouragement to you and your family. Um, 
I want to let you know a couple of announcements. First of all, in the next few weeks, we're going to be moving all of the videos uh, to our new church uh, YouTube page, um, and they'll be posted there for you to view. Uh, we will put a link in, in Facebook, on our Facebook page, so that you can just click on that. It'll take you to the YouTube page. We'll also send out an email with a direct link so that you can find all of the videos that are there. What's nice about using YouTube is that now the YouTubes will be able to be grouped together in, in, uh, in lists, watch lists. So when we have a series, all the videos in a series will be there in chronological order. It's a little bit easier to find things or to direct friends to check it out. So we hope it turns out to be a help. And uh, if you have any problems, you just reach out to us. We'll, we'll coach you through it. But we'll send you an email with instructions here in the next week or two. We are planning to do another outdoor in-person service, but we're going to wait until the weather breaks uh, so it's not so, uh, quite so warm. And uh, uh, so as soon as that looks like it's going to happen, we're going to let you know. Uh, we don't have a time frame yet about meeting in person indoors yet, but we are working on making preparations for that. Uh, one thing that we will do in the next few weeks is also launch a watch party. And what that means is while we're still using this online uh, platform, uh, for those of you that feel comfortable doing this, uh, you'll be able to come to the church building and we will have a, a large TV where you can watch the online service along with others in the room. And so we're hoping that'll bridge that feeling of quite, you know, not being so isolated for those of you that are comfortable. And for those of you that are still staying home, still need to be isolated, you'll know that we're still all consuming the same service. Uh, it's just a different setting. So uh, we'll give you information about those uh, updates and those uh, Im improvements as we go along. Well, I want to get into the message today. The last two Sundays, we attempted to apply what we have learned in our study of the book of 1 Timothy. What does it mean for us to be the church in a post-church or a post-Christian culture? It was a lot to digest, I admit, and, and we're all still processing some of that. Well, in the past week, uh, I've had a chance to hear and talk to many of you as I try to contact everybody in our church and just check in, see how you're doing. Um, when I asked you the question, how are you doing, I heard l variations of the same thing. I'd hear things like, well, we're just hunkered down, or we're just plodding on, we just keep on keeping on. What, somebody said, uh, well, we're doing pretty well under the circumstances, and that made me laugh because... Uh, one of my favorite authors and teachers, Dallas Willard, used to say, whenever somebody would say that, they're doing pretty well for under the circumstances, he'd say, well, what are you doing down under there? Uh, well, anyway, if I had asked you back in January or February how you, f you, how you would feel if we suddenly stopped being able to go to church, I wonder how you would have answered that. Would you have expected it to have the kind of impact that it has on us? I mean, you feel it. You, you're telling me about it. We feel it. Hey, do, I wonder, do you think that when we finally do get back together in person, do you think we're going to have a deeper appreciation for our worship gatherings? I, I, I hope so. I think so. You know, it's easy right now to feel like all of us are in some kind of a holding pattern. It's like we're marking time. And everybody knows that if you're marking time, you're not making progress, right? And so over, over all the conversations I've had with so many of you in the last week or so, I kept hearing something that said, well, we're hanging in there. But implied was this idea that we're hanging in, but that means we're not making progress. You know, because we don't know what the months will bring, we... We can think that our days can't go anywhere, or it doesn't matter how we spend them. Somehow, when the months, we don't know what the months are going to bring, it feels like the days don't matter. Jesus might have said it this way. He might have said something like, you've heard it said that a life that's in a holding pattern can't accomplish important things for my kingdom. But I tell you 
that even the smallest act done for me will not go unrewarded. And so that's what I want to talk about today. What do we do while we're doing nothing? What does a holding pattern look like? And does it really mean no progress? So if you have a copy of the scriptures, open it to Matthew chapter 10. Or you can follow along. Remember, uh, besides the chat, there is a, a tab uh, down below where you can click for notes. And there's, all of the sermon notes are right there, including the passages. <clears throat> now, I hope before you click to the notes, I hope that you had a chance to go ahead and log in, to sign in, and say hello on chat. Um, I can tell you that even though we see that little number up there, 21, 22, 23 people viewing, which, by the way, often there's more than one person viewing each of those. So, you know, uh, but, but it's so nice when you guys sign in and say, hey, we're here, hi, and, and you check in. It just kind of feels like we are connecting. So I hope you can do that. If you have trouble with that, you let us know. Well, Matthew chapter 10, starting in verse 42, we read this. This is Jesus talking. Uh, he had just uh, appointed his disciples as apostles, and he's giving them instructions and sending them out. And in verse 42, he says, And if anyone gives you even a cup of cold, if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. Now, if you're using your own copy of the scriptures, uh, I want to encourage you to, we're going to circle or underline some words. If you're using the notes, you'll notice that I already have some words underlined. First, there's this phrase, if anyone gives even a cup, even, what he means is something as small as, as simple as, no extravagant gestures. He says, even something as small as a cup of water. So there is no act that's too small to be noticed. And he says, if anyone gives even a cup of cold water, believe it or not, this is important because, you see, often, especially in, in the Middle East, uh, you, know, uh, you, you might have a, a, a jar of water sitting around, and, and to give somebody water from that jar, the water would be room temperature. It's been sitting there all day. The idea here of cold water is that it's... it's probably just drawn from the well. It's fresh in a sense. It hasn't been sitting there all day. So it's fresh and it's cool. You see, there is some intention here. There is some consideration. It's not like, oh yeah, no big deal. No, 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 let me, let me get you a cup of fresh water. You know, this idea of giving a cup of cold water, it's a pure, simple symbol of pure, simple care not extravagant, not showboating, just meeting a real need, even though it's simple. Jesus says, if somebody does this for one of these who is my disciple, and the idea here is that he says one of these little ones, like insignificant. Who exactly is insignificant? I mean, in our, in our culture, in society, in social media, uh, I mean, we, we're all about stars, right? Uh, it's easy to see how some people might be made to feel insignificant. We might think that some people are insignificant. Jesus seems to be saying, look, no matter how insignificant you think this person is, when you do something to bless them because of me, in this case, he says, they're, they're my disciples. So you're blessing them because of their association with me. There are some people that are hard to love, but we love them because they are loved by him. Jesus goes on, Matthew 40, 10, 42. He says, truly, I tell you that that person certainly will not lose their reward. I want you to notice, truly and certainly, Jesus is saying absolutely, positively, no way is that going to be overlooked. In fact, he says, they will not lose their reward. It's funny, uh, sometimes in our little flavor of Christianity, we don't talk much about rewards. We somehow feel like talking about rewards or doing something because we'll be rewarded is like the, not a good motivation 
you know. And I understand that. Hey, we want to do it because of who Jesus is. But if being rewarded was a bad motivation, then Jesus should stop offering it. The truth is, he offers it often, and it's not a bad motivation. Now, especially Matthew, it's kind of interesting. The other gospel writers, they only use the word reward once or twice. John, in his gospel, never even uses the word. Matthew, the tax collector, <laughs> he uses it 13 times. Okay? Matthew liked being rewarded. He assumed other people liked being rewarded. And I think Jesus is saying, I, and I intend to reward. That's the right thing to do. Jesus' point is clear. You don't, he, what he's saying is you don't need to do huge things for God in order to please him. In fact, he says, it's enough to notice a common need and then meet it with thoughtfulness. Hear that. It's enough to notice a common need and then meet it with thoughtfulness. Jesus promises acts like that will not go unrewarded. Now, this passage is not just about acts of service, although as good as that would be. It's bigger than just doing nice things for people. Look a little bit ahead in verse 40, just a few verses ahead of this. In verse 40, he says, Anyone who welcomes you, talking to his disciples, welcomes me. And anyone who welcomes me, welcomes the one who sent me. Now, the word welcome, when it's used as a verb, means to greet, to accept, to admit, to embrace to receive gladly. To offer a welcome is put parallel with offering a cup of cold water. And I think what Jesus is saying is there's something more than just an act of service here. There's an attitude of welcome. Now we tend to think of welcome as something that you, you offer to people who are brand new. And that is true. We welcome people who are new. But we don't just offer a welcome to people who are new. I mean, I'm thinking that back in the good old days when people could come to your house, right? Or you could go someplace and meet people. We would welcome, hey, and we greet each other. We'd say, ah, oh, so good to see you. How have you been? And there is something, even as I talk about it, I, I feel like, man, I remember the good old days. We've, we've been missing that. Welcome is an attitude of openness to others. We're letting them in to our lives. We're letting them know that they've been missed. You know, we're living in what's been termed the age of loneliness. We are more connected than ever. And simultaneously, we are more isolated than ever. We rely on social media in place of face-to-face -face contact. And now it's made worse when we're not supposed to be face-to-face. -face. We bemoan the deterioration of conversation, even as we spend more and more time looking down at our screens than at the people we're talking to. I don't know if you've been out to a restaurant lately, but eventually, like, we're starting to be able to go to a few. And Cindy and I went to one, and it was funny to watch two young people sitting at a table across from each other, and neither one of them were looking at each other. They are looking at their phones. The problem is that we, we don't give ourselves permission to talk about things that really matter. One of, our, one of the biggest resources of resilience in combating loneliness, it's what psychologists call common humanity. To the degree to which you see your struggles as a part of the human experience. To feel less lonely in our stress, two things help. This is what uh, a, a Stanford psychologist, uh, Kelly McGoogle, uh, wrote. 
The first is to increase our awareness of other people's sufferings. And the second part is to be more open about our own. You know, welcome is something, it's more than what we offer to newcomers. It's becoming uh, open to others, welcoming them, into, wel welcoming them into our lives in every respect, becoming more aware of their hurts and their hangups, and identifying with them by being more willing to share our hurts and hangups. You know, as, as I've been calling around talking to many of you, and I'd say, well, how are you? And some of you are so sweet, they're like, oh, we're good. How are you? And you try to turn it toward me and you express concern for Cindy and the loss of her brother or how I'm doing, what the church is doing, you know, and, and I, we appreciate that. And, and hopefully some of you, I shared some, at least some, some struggles. I, I don't want you to think that we don't struggle. We, we do. And it's an honor when I, when I call around. It's an honor to hear what you're struggling with. Sometimes you apologize. Oh, I'm sorry. I, hate to, I don't want to burden you. <laughs> it's not a burden. You're complimenting me. You're letting me in. You see, we can't really encourage one another, strengthen each other, unless we know what we're struggling with. It actually makes the bond stronger. You see, when you talk about what you're struggling with and I talk about what I'm struggling with and we seek to help each other, we build on what we have in common. And what we also have in common is the need for a Savior and Jesus' provision for us. You know, from beginning to end, the Bible talks about the importance of hospitality, welcoming the outsider, welcoming the stranger, helping the needy, from the book of Leviticus all the way through the book of Hebrews, all the way into 1 Timothy that we just finished studying. Remember when they give the, the credentials for elders and deacons? They had to be apt or be open to be hospitable. It was right there. This is about opening ourselves up. And I think it's part of what we've been missing because it feels like we're, we're not opening up. We have to shut up and we're, we're kind of closing in, turning inward. Now, as I talk about opening up, I can hear the excuses already. Mike, you don't understand. My life is a mess. I, I, I can't help someone else until I get my life together. Or some of you are saying, I have nothing to offer. I, 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 I've, I've got nothing good to offer. I'm unworthy. And I, I want you to realize that those two statements are, are mutually contradictory. You see, from what we just heard from, from Jesus and from some of the psychology, if your life is a mess, if you are working through pain and trying to make better decisions, then you actually have a great deal to offer someone else. You don't have to offer solutions. You can just simply offer your progress report, good or bad. You see, common humanity, that's what is missing. Common humanity, com unity, community. I think that up until now, we would have just taken community for granted. But now with some of this uh, quarantining and, and, and hunkering in place, right, we start to believe that if, if we're not together, that there can be no community. But the truth is, opening ourselves up to others and listening to them, that can still happen today. Many of you who are listening today, you would want others to know that they matter to God, right? But I want you to think about this. They will hear that, but they'll probably need to know before they hear that, that they matter to you. Before they're going to believe they matter to God, they're going to need to know that they matter to us. Now, luckily, this doesn't require you to become a missionary to Toga Toga or wherever that is, right? 
In fact, remember in, J- in Matthew eleven thirty, 30, Jesus said that my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus makes this easy for us. What could be easier? Starting right where you are with all the stuff that you struggle with every day. Just start right there and then welcome the next person who comes along with a need that you can help with and begin to share with them. Now, Jesus made it clear that not everybody who comes along will be worthy of getting your help. We don't open our lives up to everyone. In fact, if you look just a little f- sooner up there in the book of uh, Matthew, in, in Matthew w- verse 14, he says, he's given the, ins- the disciples instructions. He says, if anyone will not welcome you or will not listen to your words, then leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Shaking the dust off, is kind of, we, today we would say, you, we would wash our hands of them. Okay, God, they're still your problem, but they're no longer my problem. And this includes the wisdom to honor appropriate boundaries. Not everybody should have equal access to everything in our lives. But when it's appropriate to be willing to share when we're struggling, not just our victories, that's when real community begins. And although that is most natural to do it face-to-face, it can happen in a lot of different ways. There was a day when people had pen pals. And even though it took days or weeks for a letter to get there, when it arrived, it meant something. You may not know what the next few months are going to bring. We may not know what the next few months we're going to bring. But don't let that stop you from doing something today. Maybe you have a friend's cell number. So why don't you pray for them? And then send them a text that says, hey, I just prayed for you. Or what if someone contacts you? Says, how are you doing? Be willing to share an appropriate struggle with them. I just heard from a person who said that they're facing kind of a a health crisis. And and as they shared this, they said, "Uh, but I am trying to trust the Lord in ways that I haven't in the past. Now, you can read that one of two ways. They're doing better than they used to. It's it's also obvious that they don't trust the Lord completely all the time. Who does? Who does? And I celebrated with them. And after I was done talking, I felt so honored that they would share that with me. So if somebody contacts you, be willing to share your struggles. And if you've been blessed, find a way to share that with somebody, share some of your bounty with someone else who has a need. Give someone FaceTime. Give them some talk time. Just remember, they're in the same race that you are, the human race. We all fail. We all struggle. But what we do for one another is the difference between a life that is lean and a life that is rich. I want to close with this passage, and I've shared it with you before. We all know John 3.16. But we all should know John 3, 1 John 3, 16. And I'm actually going to start at the be- earlier in the chapter, uh, verses 1 to 3 and then to 16. 1 John 3, 1. John says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us. Do a word study on that word, lavished. That we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world doesn't know us is that it didn't know Him. Dear friends, John writes, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. We're not done yet. But we know that when Christ appears, we will be like him, for we will see him face to face. Do you really think that learning to love from a distance is something new? Followers of Christ have been loving him this way since his resurrection. This is nothing new. Verse 3, he says, All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. 
I know that as you've been hanging in there, it can feel like you're wearing out. But do you know that instead, John says, you're actually purifying your heart and your soul. Now, let's skip down to verse 16. 1 John 3, 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech only, but with action and truth. Perhaps in these last few weeks, you've been feeling a little isolated. That would be normal. But do you know what God can do with that feeling of isolation? He can use it as a trigger, saying to you, Mike, if you're feeling isolated, I'll bet someone else is feeling that way too. How about if you deal with your isolation by reaching out to someone so that they don't feel so isolated? You can send a card. A couple of you sent cards to Cindy, the passing of her brother, and it meant so much to know that Look at what they did. It took a couple of days for this to get here. They were thinking of me. She was really encouraged. You can send a card. You can send a note. You can leave a voicemail. You can send a text. There are so many things, a little Facebook message. We have so many ways to connect. We need to use those tools to encourage one another. And guess what? During this time when we don't know what the next few months look like, We can still make sure every day really counts. Let me pray for you. (sighs) Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for this challenging time that we live in. Because we realize that as we try to navigate some of these feelings and these experiences and these challenges... That is something that you can use in our lives to make us all the more attentive to the people around us. To be honest, sometimes I think it it looks lazy when I think back to how I kind of just depended on someone appearing in front of me before I really thought of them. But now that we're a little bit more separated and not sure of what the future looks like, this is a good time for us to master the art of connecting with one another, thinking of one another, praying for one another, and communicating that care. Not just being encouraging, but also sharing our own struggles. What a miracle it would be, Lord, if after all of this uh, separation and isolation, when we emerge as the church, with stronger community than ever before. I pray that you would make that a possibility in our lives, that we could be a blessing and be blessed ourselves. Teach us to trust you and to love those around us, to offer that cup of cold water, because just like you promised, there is no way you won't reward even that small faithfulness. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, stay tuned for Kids Men, and we'll see you soon. God bless. Hey, everyone. My name is Susanna, but you can call me Suze. We're going to kick the day off by singing about God together. So everyone, stand up and sing along.
everything God is greater, greater than my feelings He knows everything, He knows everything You know when I'm lonely You know when I'm sad, I know And then you are with me Trust you, yeah, I can trust you. You don't want perfection, you just want my best. And when my mind is racing, you will give me rest. God is greater, greater than my feelings, He knows everything. He knows everything God is greater, greater than my feelings He knows everything He knows everything you are greater than all I feel You know it all and you always will I trust in you with all that I've got Doesn't even matter if I feel it or not Woo! You are greater than all I feel You know it all and you always will I trust in you with all that I've got Doesn't even matter if I feel it or not Woo! God is greater, God is greater, greater than my feelings He knows everything He knows everything God is greater Great singing, everyone! We all have feelings, but no matter what, God is greater than our feelings. That's what this Blueprint series is all about. Have any of you ever seen a TV show or a YouTube video about building or construction? Well, I have the honor of being one of the hosts of the hit construction show, Build It, with my good pal, Skip. Take a look at what happened while we were filming our latest episode. Susanna, are you ready to get started on today's project? No time, Skip. You're going to have to fly solo on this one. I have to get these blueprints to the contractor working on the Joneses' house. Wait, no, Suze, don't leave me. I don't know how to fly solo. I need your help. Okay, maybe I can do this. What is this project anyway? A jelly bean dispenser for Jake Allman. Got it. Well, that came together in no time. Now, uh, what to do, what to do, what to do. Huh. What to do. <laughs> Construction log, time 5.42. This marks 10 minutes without Susanna. I've managed to complete the project all alone. What's next? Only time will tell. Construction log, time 5.44. I've been trying the jelly beans, and of the 18 flavors I've tried, booger is my least favorite. Oh, oh. oh. Maybe I'll leave those for Susanna, if she ever decides to return.
construction log. Time 549. Susanna has been gone for a total of 17 minutes. I can feel the loneliness starting to grip at my sad little heart. This is worse than having to eat a million booger flavored jelly beans. What are you looking at, Steve? You think you have it all figured out because you have a little friend there? Well, just you wait. Just wait until your little friend decides to let you fly solo. Suit yourself, Steve. I don't need your judgment. Gary will back me up, isn't that right, Gary? Gary, we talked about this. You're supposed to back me up. John? What did you say, John? Oh, guys, how are we ever going to make it without Susanna? Gary, where are you going? Gary, don't you leave me too! No! Oh, man. Those are some serious feelings we're dealing with here. I think there's something important we can all learn from that. Whenever we start to feel our emotions building up, we need to deal with how we are feeling. And here are three steps into doing just that. The first step is we need to stop and see how we are really feeling. This can be tough, but it's so important because if we're not careful, we can let our emotions get the best of us. If that happens, things can seem worse than they actually are, which can cause us to make decisions that we can't undo. So let's stop right now and talk about the emotions we just saw. Skip sure was feeling pretty lonely when I left the shop that day. And I know what it's like to feel lonely. Loneliness can get to us in lots of ways. Like if someone doesn't want to hang out with us, or if we can't go to school for a while. If we're not careful, we'll start to believe that no one wants to be around us or cares about us. That's when we need to do step two, which is look at what's really going on. Skip missed me because we always work together, but then he created these other friends for himself. But if Skip would have looked, he would have seen that I left because I had another important project to work on, not because I didn't want to hang out with him or help him. And if Skip would have looked even closer, he would have seen that he's never really alone at all. I know this because of step three, which brings me to the next part of how we should deal with what we feel, listening. If Skip would have listened, he would have learned that Jesus is always with him. We've got to listen to God's blueprint for life, the Bible. God gave us the Bible as the blueprint for how we should deal with what we feel. Here, check this out. Hey everybody, listen up. Here's what God has to say. Um, where is everybody? Hello? Anyone? What's up, man? We're all right here. Oh, that's a relief. I was beginning to feel really lonely. I get that. Everybody can feel lonely sometimes, but listen up. You don't have to feel lonely anymore. For real? Tell me more. In John chapter 4, there was a Samaritan woman who felt lonely. We know this because she came to draw water from the well all by herself and at a time of day when no one would be there. Well, that's kind of sad. Sounds like she didn't have any friends. It seems that way. Most women would go get water together. They would talk and laugh on the way to the well and help each other as they filled their jars. Everyone knew this woman had made some pretty bad mistakes in her life. Because of her bad decisions, no one would be friends with her. Instagram followers? Zero. Think you could say that. So Jesus was traveling from Judea to Galilee. Back then, people would walk from town to town, which could be very tiring. Dude, according to this map, that's about 70 miles. That's quite a hike. 
I bet it took forever. We don't know how long it took, but we do know that Jesus and his disciples stopped in Samaria. And because it was a really hot time of day, Jesus decided to rest by a well where people would come to get water. Too bad he didn't have a camel back. A camel back? I'm sure there was a camel with a back around there somewhere, but what good would that do? You know, it'd keep him hydrated. He could sip water through it as he walked. Oh, a camel back. Like those backpacks you put water in, not a camel back. That makes a lot more sense. Either way, Jesus didn't have a camel back. Instead, he asked a Samaritan woman to give him a drink. What? What did she do? Well, in those days, Jews were not supposed to talk, eat, or drink with Samaritan people. Jesus was a Jew, so the woman was shocked that he would ask her for a drink. Kind of like if a superhero were to ask their arch nemesis for a cherry slushie? <laughs> that would, like, never happen. Yeah, it was a big deal for Jesus to speak to her let alone ask her to get him a drink. She listened as Jesus began to tell her about God's gift that could be hers. What kind of gift are we talking about? Like a new pair of Nikes? A trip to Disney World? A new car? Uh, not quite. None of those things were around back then. Besides, they don't even compare to the gift Jesus was offering her. He told her about the gift of living water. Is that the kind of water you chug down on a hot, sweaty day? No, it's not that kind of water that you drink, but the kind that helps you to never be thirsty again. Just like water satisfies our thirst, Jesus satisfies our hearts. He fills us with his love that never runs out. Sign me up for that. I bet the woman wanted this kind of water. She did. She had been living a lonely life, and she hadn't always made the right decisions. In fact, Jesus told her everything she had done. Oh, like when she spit her vegetables out in her napkin so her parents wouldn't know she didn't eat them? But, uh, oh, 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 oh. But Jesus didn't make her feel bad for those wrong things. He only wanted her to see how much he cared about her. That's the best. So how did that help her not feel lonely anymore? Well, when we decide to follow Jesus, it's like taking a sip of living water. Jesus fills our hearts up with his love. From then on, he is always with us, and there is never a reason to feel all alone. So, even when I'm by myself in my room, Jesus is with me? Yep. What about when I'm with a lot of people and I don't know who they are, and I still feel alone? Jesus is with me then, too? Even then. Jesus loves you, and he loves me. When I feel lonely, Jesus is with me. The woman at the well was lonely, and one of the lies she probably believed was that no one understood her or cared about her. But Jesus came alongside her. He showed her that he loved her, and if she would follow him, she would never be alone again. That wasn't just true for the woman at the well. That's true for you and me today. The next time we're missing our friends or wondering if anyone cares about us, we can stop, look, and listen to the truth of God's Word. And then we'll remember that Jesus is always with us. And that's what we need to know today. Everyone say it with me. When I feel lonely, Jesus is with me. That's it. You can deal with how you feel when you stop, look, and listen. Now we're going to play a game called Spot It. Two cards will appear on your screen, and your job is to spot the object that appears on both of the cards as quickly as possible. You'll have 10 seconds before the cards disappear, so try to spot it fast. On your mark, get set, go! Great game, everyone. Now there's one more way that we can deal with our feelings, and that's to worship God by singing. So let's do it.
questions to help your family talk about what you learned today and pray together. And we'll see you guys next week.